Let's pray together, please. Father, it's a great joy to have the nourishment of your holy word, to go into our minds and hearts at any time of the day, and to be able to gather here together as a church, to be open the words of eternal life in scripture, to hear them. And we pray that you would be with us as we listen to scripture, as we look at many passages, that we would love our local churches, that we would be devoted to one another as Jesus Christ has made us a family, and that he chose all of us in him before the foundation of the world, all that really would truly come to know him, and that we are connected to each other in that spiritual bond of fellowship. And we pray that we would value that and love one another, carry one another's burdens, and love indeed with a love that covers a multitude of sins. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. This evening's message is really dovetailing on this morning's message. I wanted to do a whole message to you on the importance of the church because when the people of God there in Nehemiah's day were convicted of their sins and were assured of God's mercy and grace, they, they vowed to be dedicated to their church and they vowed to make sure that its work did not fail and that it would be part of their lives day in and day out. So I wanted to preach on the precious doctrine of the church. 1 Peter 4, verse 8, this is God's word. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. And then one other passage I wanted to read, uh, turn to the left there in your Bible, to Colossians 1, 29. Colossians 1, 29. Colossians chapter 1, verse 8. 29. Colossians 1, 29, and I'm going to give a, a translation of uh, the verb for striving that's actually the literal Greek word there. Look at verse 29. This is God's word. For this purpose I also labor, agonizing according to his power, which mightily works within me. May God bless the reading of his word. <clears throat> Y'all know one of my favorite hymns is the church's one foundation. One of the stanzas of that great hymn is the church shall never perish. Her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain, and cherish is with her to the end. Though there be those that hate her and false sons in her pale against or foe or traitor, she ever shall prevail. I want to remind us this evening, looking at many passages together, that God loves the visible church. God loves the visible church. Not just the invisible spiritual body of Christ. He loves the visible church. The Holy Spirit of God breathed forth a dozen letters through the Apostle Paul to local gatherings of Christian people. I'm sure some were, were bigger than others. Some were probably pretty small to instruct them, and to help them be better churches. The book of Revelation contains seven letters that were dictated by Jesus to local congregations, to local gatherings of Christian people, where he addressed those places very directly about what they were doing well and what they needed to repent of. So many Christians today think of the word church only and exclusively as the whole body of believers in the world. And certainly the word church can and does mean that at times in Scripture. And it's perfectly legitimate to speak of the church in the world today. But we need to remember the biblical doctrine of membership in a local church with elders who are your elders. Where the word of God is preached accurately. Where the sacraments are administered faithfully. And worship is conducted in simplicity according to the word of God. Every Christian person ought to be a member of a local church, a local body of believers with elders over them who are their elders, with brothers and sisters in Christ that they have regular fellowship with, regular communication with. Local Christian churches today are having a bit of a hard time. The statistics are, are in. Um, a fifth of the people that quit going to church when COVID hit still don't go to church. Many have decided to discard church altogether from their spiritual life and simply do 
watching something from home, home Bible studies, whatever. That is, of course, nothing new. That's not new. I was recently reading the historical forward to a, a two-volume work by a, a 18th century Dutch theologian, uh, Van der Gru is his last name, his exposition of the Heidelberg Catechism published by Reformation Heritage. And the historical forward to the book, one of the reasons that Van der Gru wrote that, that wonderful theology of the Heidelberg Catechism was the, the rise of what they called conventicles. And I actually looked up conventicles. I'm like, what is a conventicle? Well, a conventicle was a home Bible study. People were sick of the church. We're just going to have home Bible studies now. That's been in every century since the apostles died. Every century has had those kinds of movements. Home Bible studies, home church to replace the local church. Nothing new under the sun. One thing that's always bothered me greatly is professing Christians who are very critical in general of local Christian churches, but who either don't attend a church or have little to no commitment or love For their own church. And I've had to tell many such people. Hey if you're the only one who understands what true godliness is. And you're the one who's living a godly Christian life. By all means come in here and show us how it's done. Why would you deprive us of your holy presence? Of course we all know that's not why they say things like that. I just want to encourage you. Don't be a critic of Jesus Christ's bride. If you're not willing to lift a finger to help it be better. If you want to know how Jesus responds to people that mock, abuse, or criticize his bride, I would encourage you to read very slowly the book of Revelation. He does not take very well to that at all. You might think twice before you start throwing verbal grenades at what Jesus died to save and what he died to build in this world. Now we should expect unbelievers, of course, they don't like the church. They they hate the visible church in this world. They'll always be hurling their venom toward us if we're, if we're faithful. If we're like them, they'll, they'll love us. They'll never criticize us. But if we stand for what's true and stand for what is against them, then, yeah, they'll hurl their hatred upon us. But it must truly offend and grieve God when those who claim to be blood-bought believers and his son will have nothing to do with the local church. Or if they, they, they love their church, but only with a love that covers a sin or two. What's our passage say? Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers multitude of sins. For the people of God to stick together, for local churches to stay healthy, we have to love each other with a love that covers a multitude of sins. Now notice, it doesn't say love each other with a love that covers a multitude of false gospels or covers a multitude of false Jesuses or a multitude of blasphemies or anything like that. But it does say to love with a love that covers a multitude of sin. We love with the same love that God has loved us with. A patient love that covers a multitude of sins. Being a member of a local Christian church that preaches the true gospel and tries to be faithful to the sacraments, tries to be faithful in discipline so that the church is different from the world. You realize the church that will not discipline its members and will not hold them accountable, it ceases to be holy. And what good is a church that's not holy? That's not holy. It's not the church then. But being a member of a church that at least is trying to do those things is not something we should ever take for granted. Now I want to look at three things here. If you see your bulletin there, there's a three-point outline. What is church membership? Where is church membership in Scripture? And why is church membership a pressing subject today? So first of all, point number one, what is church membership? We are a culture that prizes the individual. Consumerism and individualism dominates everything. And this carries over into people's understanding of the church. And there's a temptation to view the church as an organization that either does or does not meet my personal perceived needs. And so different churches have different products that that can meet those needs that you perceive. And therefore, I will or will not be dedicated to my church insofar as I perceive that it's doing this. The church, biblically speaking, is very different from this. Church membership is an essential part, the essential part, of Christian discipleship. The Christian life in the New Testament, in New Testament terms, as I hope to demonstrate to you from many passages this evening, cannot possibly be conceived apart from membership in a local church. 
The New Testament does not have a category for any professing Christian who is not a baptized member of a local church. Historically, membership has been signified by long-term membership vows. You commit to that local church and they commit to you. In order to see through God's eyes the true importance of the Christian church, you have to understand its historical origination. Where does the church come from? Why, why are we here right now? Why, why are there professing Christians in this room right now, and I'm up here in front of you with a Bible open and reading passages to you? Where, where did that come from historically? And the point here will be that if God has called you out of darkness and made you his own, he has made you part of the gathered people of God in this world. The church is inaugurated historically in Genesis 3.15. God announces that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent in behalf of certain people, certain fallen undeserving sinners, and these will be the church. Those that follow the seed of the woman and who are not of the seed of the serpent. We know from many other passages of scripture that this crushing of the serpent's head will be done for the church, for the individuals that were given by God the Father to God the Son in eternity past. In Acts 20, 28, the Apostle Paul described to those elders in Ephesus, he was trying to get them to see the importance of these people. If you're an elder, there's nothing more important than the people that you shepherd. Paul said to them, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. It's the only thing God ever purchased with his own blood. Those people. They are so important to the Lord. These are the ones who were given to Jesus Christ and the covenant of redemption before time began. Jesus talked about them constantly in the Gospel of John. When he prayed his high priestly prayer the night before he was arrested and crucified, he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. That's the church. Ephesians 1, Paul understood it. He knew when he had been given to Christ. He said to that church there in Ephesus, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and without blame before him, meaning before him on the day of judgment, in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons. All of those predestinated unto life, all predestined to adoption, that's the church. Jesus gave us the ultimate purpose statement for his incarnation, John 6, 38. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing. Who are those? All he has given me, that's the church. That's the church. That's why you've heard me say it, and I'll say this until I'm dead in the ground. If you don't believe in unconditional election, you have no doctrine of the church. If you're in Arminian, the Arminian, Arminian position where all men have this autonomous free will and they, they're the ones that make themselves Christian, they have no doctrine of the church. There is no church in that system. Who is the church? Those chosen by God before the foundation of the world and given to Christ. That's the church. And if you don't believe that, you don't have a doctrine of the church in your system. God the Father gave a love gift to his son. The church, all of his elect, a multitude of human beings so vast, no one can count them. And Jesus Christ will save them all perfectly, infallibly, and he will build his visible church on earth. This is where the church of Jesus Christ originated. It was in eternity past. It was in the love of God the Father for God the Son. If you are a true Christian, if you are a true Christian, a blood-purchased, redeemed child of God, you are part of that love gift of God the Father to God the Son in eternity past. And therefore, we are all connected to one another because we're all part of that same love gift, the church. How completely inappropriate would it be for such a person to turn away from being part of that love gift, that worshiping community in the world, the church of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to Timothy in his final letter before he died, 2 Timothy 1.8, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me as prisoner, 
but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. That's the church. So when we ask the question, what is the church? That Greek word ekklesia, it's used over a hundred times in the New Testament. That word ekklesia, the word that we translate as church or congregation, it literally means the called out ones. The called out ones. This is the doctrine of the invisible church. All of the elect that God the Father gave as a love gift to his son in eternity past. The great Westminster Confession says of this invisible church, it says the Catholic, not Roman Catholic, but small c, universal. The Catholic or universal church, which is invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered together into one under Christ the head thereof, and is the spouse, the body, the fullness of him that filleth all and all. But when we speak of church membership, we are talking about physical human beings who are alive right now, who profess to be Christians along with their households. Their children who are gathered together into the local churches with them, who are under the authority of ordained church officers in subjection to the word of God. This is how Jesus Christ has always historically been manifested in, his, in this world. The, the body of Christ is manifested in this way. Those who profess the true religion and their children and their households. And I want to tell you, there is no such thing as a Christian who does not attend one, does not attend a church, and who does not have a desire to be joined with fellow believers in a local church. It's just, not, it's a non-category in the Bible. 1 John 4, 21. This, is, this commandment we have received from him, he who loves God must love his brother also. So that's the invisible church. Now the doctrine of the visible church is a little bit different from this. The Westminster Confession, summarizing scores of passages of Scripture, describes it this way. The visible church, which is what this is right here, which is also called Catholic or universal under the gospel, not confined to one nation as before under the law, consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion and of their children, and is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the house and family of God, out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. And that is precisely what God calls people in space and time to become part of. The calling of Abram. Remember way back in Genesis 12, the calling of Abram is where the church begins to take historical form in the nation of Israel. Abraham and his children and his household after him. Individual believers and their children and their households. This is what the visible church has always been composed of. It's always been composed of those that profess the truth and their households, their children. Genesis 18, 19, God said about Abraham, I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Abraham is to command his children, his household after him, to know the Lord, to follow his commandments. This is how the church is to operate and to self-perpetuate in the world. In the New Testament, there is one people of God, the church, the called out ones in the Old Testament, and the church in the New Testament. One people of God. Folks, it's not Israel and the church. It's the church and the church. The commanding of one's children and one's household is part of the church before in the Old Testament, the coming of Christ, and it's part of the church after the coming of Christ in the New Testament. Remember this great scene when David was, or when uh, uh, Solomon was, was dying, or uh, when David was dying and he was talking to his son Solomon? First Chronicles 28, 9, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Far from being merely an Old Testament teaching, this exact same pattern flows right into the New Testament, Ephesians 6, 4. You fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Teach them to know Christ. Teach them our catechism. Teach them the word of God and pray that God would save them. We are part of this sacred group of people, God's people and their households. That's never changed. We often talk about there being a lack of church discipline today. And people commit all kinds of very serious sins and continue to attend church and the leaders of those churches do nothing about it. 
And obviously such is shameful and should never be the case. However, folks, y'all, you got to get this part. Please, please hear this. It is critical to know that church discipline is not merely negative. Confronting and dealing with sin and uh, among the membership. That's not primarily what church discipline is. It is two pronged. Church discipline is also and primarily the ongoing reading and preaching of the word of God. And the instruction of God's people to believe and obey all that Christ commanded us. Right now, we are engaged in church discipline. Many people simply say, look, I'm a member of the body of Christ. I don't need to be a member of or attend a local church. And when they say I'm a member of the body of Christ, they they mean the, the spiritual brotherhood of believers all over the world. And while that is certainly true... To believe that acknowledging this is all that's required of professing Christians in this world is to miss one of the clearest teachings in the Bible. Jesus Christ established his church, the visible church. And as I said, there is no context for discipleship outside of membership in one. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The ongoing teaching, the ongoing instruction of the ordained officers of the local church, and thus Jesus' ongoing building of the church in this world, that is not possible if people discard their commitment to a local visible church. The building of the church means the visible church. The physical, local people of God and their children are that which Jesus is building. Jesus did not found a Bible study, although he often uses them for good. When they are under the oversight of and in association with and supportive of a local church. Jesus did not found parachurch ministries either, although he often uses them for good. When they are in association with, under the oversight of, and supportive of a local church. Jesus did not found Christian social events. Jesus did not found anything like that. He founded the church visibly on the earth. And we're not talking only about the larger body of Christ. We're talking about local gatherings of sinful, redeemed, professing believers and their households who are under the oversight of duly elected and ordained elders who hopefully, if God is blessing them, they have some deacons and who sit under the correct preaching of the word of God and participate in the proper administration of the sacraments. In the entire Bible... The visible church is always the context of Christian nurture, growth, and discipleship. And that's why the second half of Nehemiah chapter 10 is them saying, we're going to make sure that we give our third of a shekel to the church. We're going to make sure they've got the proper wood they need. We're going to bring all of our offerings. We're all going to come to the feast. We're all going to do this stuff. We're going to be there. We're going to make sure the church doesn't suffer on our watch because God has been so good and gracious to us. In scripture, there are no Lone Ranger Christians who don't attend church, or are not members of churches. Membership in a local church is the only context for Christian discipleship that's taught in the pages of the Bible. Did Paul ever write a letter to the Bible study that meets on the side in Rome? To the parachurch ministry, to the, uh, to the ministry at the academy, the campus ministry in Colossae. They're all the churches. Okay, number two, where is the biblical evidence of church membership? Matthew 28, 19, go therefore make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The Great Commission doesn't end with those things. It begins there. Who does the baptizing? It's the officers of the church. Who does that teaching and instruction? It's the officers of the church. Jesus' people are to be a body of disciples, taught the things of God by officers in those churches. Disciples are not lone rangers who live by themselves, follow Christ by themselves, read their Bibles by themselves, etc. Nor are they outside the church in small groups that get together, read scripture together, and talk about God together. Now those things can be wonderful, but they become sinful if they take the place of or are seen as a substitute for membership and life in a local church. Redeemed, baptized Christians are part of something bigger. The visible church on earth, called by Christ, set apart by Christ, to shine his light on a hill to the watching world. 
Do you see why it's so important that we labor and love with unity in mind, that we try to stick together, we try to love one another? Not at the expense of truth ever, but unity wherever possible. In the book of Acts, how was the Great Commission carried out? The gospel was preached. Faith and repentance was granted by the Holy Spirit to lost people. And those professing uh, belief were baptized by the leaders of the church. And those converts with their households joined the saints. They didn't just go back home and continue on with life. They became part of the institution. In Acts 2, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. What does that phrase mean, added to the church? It means they were added to the visible church. These early Christian communities loved each other deeply. And they gathered together daily in the temple. They were by each other. They left their homes and came together in that group to hear the apostles' doctrine, to break bread, to fellowship together, and to live together, to love each other, to get to know each other. They persevered through some horrendous times together. They had to deal with false teaching. They had to deal with persecution from Rome, persecution from Jews, etc. But they stayed together. The bond they had in the gospel made departing from one another unthinkable. And that brings us to one of the key points of this sermon. And folks, you've got to remember this. Please remember this. There are direct biblical laws and commandments that God has spoken to you, if you claim to be a Christian, that you could not ever obey without being a member of a church. And I have to wonder, if you're not a member, are you telling me these commands don't apply to you? 1 Peter 5.5, 5, submit yourself to your elders. How can you do that if you don't have any? Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who rule over you. How can you do that if nobody rules over you, if you're not a part of a church? There's also commands to us, to me, to, your, to elders in this church, to shepherd the flock of God. How do you shepherd a flock if you don't know where they are? If you don't know who they are? Serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. How do you do that? How are you an example to a flock you don't ever see or you don't know? In the passage I just read, Paul to the Ephesian elder, shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. You can't shepherd people if you don't know who they are. You can't shepherd a flock that stays in hiding. And you can't shepherd the invisible church either. You can only shepherd and oversee real, tangible people that you know personally. And can live your church life with. There's no way to make sense of the Christian life that's laid out in the New Testament without the concept of church membership. You just can't. It's just not possible. God gathers his people together to live together in mutual submission under the government of duly elected elders and ordained officers in subjection to the word of God. And if that is not part of a professing Christian's life, that person has no right to expect growth and blessing from God. Now, I recognize what I'm saying is not popular today, but it's true. It's what Scripture says. You know, there's so much good that can be said of churches where you know people and you yourself are known by people intimately. There have been people in this church I've cried with and wept with over stuff that's going on in my own life. People who have been there for me and my family in some of the darkest moments I've ever known in this life so far. I don't know how I would have gotten through it without them. I don't. And I've tried to be there for as many of you as I, as I can. I've tried to stretch myself as thin as possible when you all have gone through stuff. But there's so much good that comes from people that know your pain and your struggles, that, know, that see your good and your bad, and they still love you. They're still there with you. They still want to see you. They know your sins and can help you overcome them. I can't shepherd people if I don't know them at all. You can't preach effectively to them either. You know, John Calvin, one of the greatest pastors that God ever gave his church, he was an amazing expositor of scripture and he would write those sermons and he wrote commentaries on almost every book of the Bible before he died and his expositional section was, was glorious. You want to understand what scripture means, you need to read Calvin's commentaries. But the application sections that he wrote in his sermons, they were based on his interactions with the people. And usually the people there didn't realize he was talking about them. And this is why, as much as I personally enjoy listening to good preaching via the internet, and I, I subscribe to a zillion podcasts and 
great stuff. I get fed every day by, by that stuff. But I want to tell you, there's no substitute for being there with someone you know and someone that knows you. There is no substitute for that. No, no amount of smartphone AI technology or whatever can replace that. Nothing can. This is exactly why Jesus appointed church government. <clears throat> Christian people need one another. They need shepherds. And you know what? Shepherds need shepherds. We're not bulletproof. We have feelings too. We have spiritual lows too. Point three, why is church membership such a huge pressing topic in our day? The great Protestant Reformation was not a liberating of Christians from the church. As much as people in our day have come to see it that way, that's not what the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation was all about. The Reformation brought into the center of attention the following essential question. Which church should I be a member of, Rome or Protestants? Now, why are there so many Protestants today who are comfortable with not attending church or not being a member of a church? Historically, here's why. You want to know why that's such a problem today? Here's why. As mainline denominations went liberal, true believers in those denominations found themselves abandoned by their own pastors, abandoned by their own elders, and they were left wondering what to do. Our pastors and elders, they don't believe anything anymore. They don't believe the gospel anymore. They don't believe the Bible anymore. And so those refugees from those apostate liberal mainline churches, they often found themselves just hanging out together, going to Bible conferences together, engaging in missionary work together. You know, even Jay Gresson Machen founded an organization called the Independent Board of Presbyterian Foreign Missions. How bizarre is that? A Presbyterian founded an organization that was independent. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to have a believing missionary organization for the world because the mainline denomination was liberal. They didn't believe anything anymore. So he had to found something outside of it and made it independent. You know, I know IVPFM missionaries to this day, people that are still part of the Independent Board of Presbyterian Foreign Missions, founded by Machen. They were desperate. The, their denomination had turned its back on God and turned its back on them. They'd been betrayed by it, so they had no use for it anymore. But you see, the, the church really left them by turning liberal and abandoning the Bible, the, the gospel, the law, and Christ. But the fact is, dear ones, the, the scriptures still stand. The solution to corruption in the church is not to turn your back on the church in general. The solution is to be part of a believing church, to found a new church that's going to be committed to the truth. And then support it, encourage it, be part of it, pray for it, weep for it as much as you can. The solution is to love with a love that covers a multitude of sins. When there's apostasy, when there's doctrinal compromise, yes, you have to abandon it. You've got to get away from that. But I would encourage you, if you have a Bible-believing church, you need to be part of it. Love it. Make a contribution to it. The church that you're a member of, if it has the word rightly preached and the sacraments rightly administered, it is a true church. The Spirit of God is there, and it's your church. It's your church. Without you, it's incomplete. I'd like to suggest something to you. I hope that you will weigh this carefully in your mind. Could it be that one of the reasons the church is as weak as it is in our country today is that many of its gifted members refuse to attend it and refuse to be part of it? There are essential parts of local bodies of Christ. They just won't come. They won't be part of it. Or they're half-hearted in their commitment to it. I think that's very likely. We're missing people that should be here. There are gifted members of the body of Christ who really could add to the life of our church, but they just won't. Just remember, it is the local expression of the body of Christ that you are an essential part of. Yes, you're part of the whole church throughout the world, but God has put you in a local church too. Those are the people that need you and your gifts. And those are the people whose gifts you need. The local church, that's where the action is. That's where the action of God is. It's where the Holy Spirit and his gifts are active. For many professing Christians today, they have a Bible study, they have a small group or something, a parachurch group that they follow, something that functions for them kind of in the place of a local church. Every true Christian, though, if they are a true Christian, no matter who they are, they long for fellowship with God's people. 
even if a true believer never does join a local church, they will try to find other Christians to be by. The entire Christian life cannot be understood or conceived of outside of membership in the local church with shepherds, teachers, and elders in your life. There are a number of questions that you need to seriously consider before you decide to speak to elders and pastors about joining a church. There are things that you need to find out about a church before you join it. Number one, are the leaders of this church faithful to the word of God? Do they preach the true gospel accurately? If you ask them, do you, do you guys believe in justification by faith alone? And their response is, does that have something to do with margins and Microsoft Word? You don't want to join that church. Do they preach the whole counsel of God? Every part of it? Are they willing to address the hard and controversial issues of the day? Such as the major points at which Satan is attacking successfully the church? Things like education and discipleship of children, marriage, biological sexes, how many there are, LGBT issues, abortion, having children, the exclusiveness of Christ's claims, the sovereignty of God, unconditional election, predestination, reprobation. Are they faithful to the word of God? Are they seeking to please God or men? Are they faithful or pragmatic? Number two, do they administer the sacraments biblically? key mark of the church. You don't have that, you don't have a church. Third, does the church have a detailed doctrinal statement? Preferably one of the great Reformation confessions like the Westminster Standards. In the absence of a detailed doctrinal statement to which the ordained officers are accountable, folks, there's literally no telling what those people might believe. There's no telling what they might believe. Do they preach the doctrines of their confession? The thing is, maybe they do have the Westminster Confession, but it's locked in a safe in the back and has been back there for 50 years. It's one thing to have a great confession, a great biblical doctrinal statement, locked in a safe in the back room as an artifact of the past. It's quite another to have leaders whose hearts are set on fire by what those confessions teach from the Word of God. Number four, do they practice church discipline? Do they lovingly and graciously confront sin and those that go astray. Do those leaders, do any of them know you personally? Do they know how to pray for you and your family? Do they hold you accountable? Do they know what sins you struggle with in your life? Do they love you? Do they love you? Fifthly, think about this one. Would you like your children and grandchildren to be under the instruction and pastoral care of the leaders in that church? Would you want your kids and grandkids to be under their oversight? If you can answer yes to those questions, you should be faithful and committed to those brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for them. Get to know them that you might rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. And I want to encourage you. Church membership is for the long haul. Once you find a faithful, godly, biblical church, be in it for the long haul. Elder work at times can be very stressful and filled with a lot of mental angst and lost sleep and prayers and tears. It's very hard at times to do the right thing, especially when you know it's going to cost you friends or family. There's a very important word that Paul uses it several times to describe the Christian life and to describe life in the church. And it's the Greek verb agonizomai. It's where we get the word agonize. And Paul told the Colossians there, to this end I also labor agonizing according to his working which works in me mightily what does agonizomai mean in greek it means to fight or struggle and to endeavor with strenuous zeal to contend now why in the world would you want to be part of something like that voluntarily go be part of something that's going to cause you agony because the lord jesus is worth it and his glory is worth it And it's worth it for us to strive together, to agonize together, to love each other, to get along well, and to glorify his name to the world. So the world looks at us and says, look at those people. There's something very different about them. Look at how they they care about each other. Look at how they love each other. We've never seen anything like that. It's exactly what life as a Christian in the local church is going to be. It's going to be a fight and a struggle. It's going to be agonizing. It's going to be heartbreaking. Church life is a blessing and it is filled with challenges too. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all things, have fervent love for one another. Why? Because God has fervent love for us. That's why Jesus died for us. Because of his great love with which he loved us, 
even while we were dead in our transgressions and sins. So have fervent love for fellow Christians, for your brothers and sisters. Have fervent love for one another. If the elders of your church preach a false gospel, you need to leave. If they deny the Trinity, you need to leave. If we start praying to the Virgin Mary, you need to leave. You don't always just stay. You don't love with a love that covers a multitude of heresy. You love with a love that covers a multitude of sins. And if you're going to hang out with a lot of Christians and be close with one another and see each other face to face, there's going to be plenty of sin that you're going to have to love with a love that covers. We're in this for the long haul with one another. And only the worst of trials ought to break our fellowship. I've mentioned to you all, by the grace of God, my parents uh, are members of the same church that they joined when I was seven. have been members of that church for 41 years. That church has been through some splits. It's been through scandal. My pastor left his wife and married the church secretary when I was 18 years old. It crushed me. A lot of people left. And I remember asking them, why, why didn't we leave? And they both looked at me and said, our faith was never in him. Our faith was in Jesus Christ. What about all those people that left? And my parents said to me, what did they expect? That sinners weren't going to sin? What did they expect? That people were going to always be good? Of course not. You stick with your church. You hang in there with it. 41 years they've been there. And now that they need help, now that their, my father's health is in decline, it's been remarkable to see long-term friendships. People that knew me when I, was real, when I was seven years old and prayed for me, they were in it for the long haul. They stuck together. And now that bond that they've had for four decades is as strong as ever. Now I want to close as I open stanza three of the church's one foundation. You see, no matter how much the church suffers, no matter how many setbacks it has, listen, the church shall never perish. Her dear Lord to defend to guide, sustain, and cherish as with her to the end. Though there be those that hate her and false sons in her pale against or foe or traitor, she ever shall prevail. Let's pray. Father, it's a blessing to be part of the glorious body of Christ. Despite its problems and its setbacks and its difficulties and the things that it agonizes through, we are so blessed to have each other. We're so blessed to have your good gifts before us here this evening, open Bibles, the Lord's Supper, and each other. May our hearts truly rejoice in the freeness of your grace, the fullness of forgiveness and salvation that you've given to us in Christ. And we pray that your church would thrive in this world, that there would be a renewal of commitment to it on the part of your redeemed people in the world who have been hurt by it, who maybe have had experiences that are so bad it's, it brings them low to even think of, of joining one. And Lord, I do understand that. But help us to love the church of Jesus Christ in this world. It's our Lord's project, and we pray that it would not suffer loss, not on our watch. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.